I think that I was thought I should be happy to marry Josh. I'd been in love with him for so long. Katie told me he was the only guy she could ever imagine living her life with. Joshua Boyle's assault trial begins in Ottawa today. Caitlin Coleman arrived at the courthouse to testify against her estranged husband. When it comes to this sexual assault trial, what makes it different is that these two were held captive in Afghanistan for five years. Coleman testified that Boyle demanded she sleep naked and set a quota for how many times a week she had to sexually satisfy him. The accused, Boyle, is out on bail. He has pleaded not guilty to all 19 charges. When I married Josh, I was told by Josh that I couldn't um, couldn't wear nail polish anymore. When it came time to testify in Josh's trial, I knew, just because I know Josh really well, I knew how upset he would be to see that I'm wearing nail polish because that would just tell him that he has no control over me anymore. I am Caitlin Coleman. I am a mother, and I am a survivor. Josh Boyle is charged with uh, sexual assault against me, as well as several counts of physical assault. make sure that they have really good, happy lives and make accomplishments in their life. But I also want to have a life full of accomplishment myself. I feel like, you know, I've been given another chance and a lot of my life was spent under Josh's thumb, but I'm not under his thumb anymore. Caitlin was, um she was very bright, very intelligent, very creative, but she, there was a naivety about her. Um, I think being homeschooled and uh, raised the way that she was raised, there was a, uh, uh, a world out there that she had never experienced. I met Josh initially on the internet. When I was 16, I was a Star Wars fan, and when Josh was about 18 at that time, and he was also a Star Wars fan and on the same internet forum. I think I fell in love with Josh because he was very intelligent, very kind of intelligent, charismatic, passionate, and he always presented himself as sort of a, a wounded puppy. I think that that appealed to me and I wanted to be the person to save him. To meet Josh in person, it was like everything that I liked about him online, but but multiplied tenfold. So he was very like physically affectionate. He was very kind in his words. By the end of the trip, um, I had had my first kiss with him. You know, Katie told me that at one point that he was the only guy she could ever imagine living her life with. I was probably the one that least liked Josh. But I was also the mother that was taught that if you push your daughter away from someone, they'll get closer. So I never really showed, you know, a lot of my true feelings about Josh. You know, he definitely seemed to be one of these people that didn't have a lot of respect for women. Josh would just make the most ridiculous, snarky remarks you could imagine, out of the blue. And he would say, oh good, you're in the kitchen where you belong, making my food for me. I think Josh had an easy fish. You know, here was this girl from, you know, the middle of nowhere, Pennsylvania, 
who had no experience at life whatsoever. And he, he worked his magic on her. Josh, after I agreed to marry him and we became engaged, Josh became very controlling. Um, he started telling me how to dress. Um, he started trying to limit the friends that I saw. Uh, he didn't like that I drank alcohol, so he, tried, he told me I shouldn't do it anymore. I asked him some of the important questions. You have to swear to me you're going to take care of her, never put her in harm's way, and you're going to be able to you know, financially support her and everything. Oh, yeah, 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 no problem. Which, of course, turned out to be a lie. And when they were first together, she was she was independent and she was um, she stood up for herself. But as time went on, and and things ground down, and you know she gave in more and more to what he wanted. Now that we were married, Josh started talking about his desires to travel overseas. I was seeing it as traveling the world together means, you know, maybe we'll backpack Europe next and Australia. And no, his interest was in the very third world, very dangerous parts of the world. Um, this was when he started talking a lot about going to Afghanistan. Um, and I told him, you know, that I wasn't going to do that. And so that we started to fight because his perspective was as my wife, you go where I go, you do what I say. Well, he tried to get me to encourage my daughter to go to Central Asia with him, particularly Afghanistan. Okay, and I said, well, you know, there's a war there. Josh, I'm not going to talk my daughter into going to Afghanistan. I said, what, why do you want to go there? What, what, what is the, what's the point? We tried to talk her and him out of it. Um, we had a discussion for about five or six hours during the middle of the night. Katie was yelling and screaming at him and crying and we weeping had to downstairs them. while they, she was packing. But we sat and talked with them, pointing out, and they pretty much agreeing, that they had nothing in common. And we thought, you know, that the trip would be off. Yeah. And we get up the next morning, and the trip is on. Now, looking back at everything that happened, it's really sad. At the time, I didn't think much of it. Uh, my dad, I think he was sleeping. Maybe I came in and said, bye, I'm going to the airport. And I said goodbye to my mother. I hugged her. You know, I promised I'd stay in touch. You know, I think I was really deluding myself about how things were. So I went, and, you know, then I didn't see them for almost for five and a half years. Joshua Boyle's assault trial begins in Ottawa. Joshua today. Boyle was arrested in December 2017, charged with assault, unlawful confinement, along the with King other crimes. Boyle is out on bail. He has pleaded not guilty to all 19 charges. In terms of sexual assault trials in Canada, that right now, this is the most closely watched trial that there is. I think what, it, what makes it different is that these two were held captive in Afghanistan for five years. A lot of people were trying to see if there would be, in addition to the domestic assault allegations, which are quite serious, they were trying to see if there would be any more details about this couple's captivity that would come out in court. On the first day when she arrived, we didn't know what she would look like. Her head was covered with a, a scarf. She just basically looked straight forward and walked into court. Even though I knew that he was going to be in the courtroom, there's still nothing really to prepare me for having to, having to see him and having to know he's there. I would see glimpses. Josh and his father would be standing by the elevators where normally we would go to leave the, that floor. Even just a glimpse of him sort of elicited a, 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 a very, like a very immediate feeling of, of fear and panic. She was actually sequestered to a separate room a couple of steps away from where the trial was happening. She wasn't facing 
her estranged husband face to face, eye to eye when she was giving testimony. Once they got back to Canada in private, he was doing, she says, beating her, trying to sexually assault her, rape her anally, biting her, hitting her, spanking her. The emotion in her voice matched the testimony that she was giving. There were several occasions where she testified that Boyle had slapped her in her face. Her voice would would quicken. There would be several pauses. She would need to take her time to, to relay that story. The Crown pointed to a list of rules Boyle had drafted. Coleman testified that Boyle demanded she sleep naked and set a quota for how many times a week she had to sexually satisfy him. Josh doesn't really take no for an answer. Whatever it was that he wanted, if you said no, then that just made him feel like he had to force you to give it to him because he didn't really accept no. He did one time actually tie me up and then uh, leave me tied up until after he went to sleep and I was able to get myself free. On the day that Coleman was testifying about the BDSM bag that Boyle had, there's this picture of all the paraphernalia that was in that bag. He looked up, and I think that was like the only real moment where, during the trial, where for a prolonged period, he stopped making notes and was just staring at Coleman, whose image was on a TV screen in the courtroom. I had agreed to go to Central Asia. He told me we were not gonna go to Afghanistan, that maybe, maybe we would dip in for one day. Josh told me the truth was that we were in Central Asia because he intended to go to Afghanistan. And when I pointed out to him that he'd said we weren't going, he said, well, I lied to you because I knew you wouldn't come to Central Asia if you thought that's what we were doing. The idea of I could just try to find my passport, steal money from Josh, walk away, wasn't something that I felt that, that I would be able to do. So I, I went to Afghanistan, but not, you know, not very willingly. I went downstairs and they had left about 40 boxes of their stuff with us. I started going through the boxes, and that's when I found the first ultrasound that she was pregnant. I was probably even shaking, and I said, my daughter is pregnant. We had been staying in Kabul, Afghanistan, and we took a taxi headed towards Ghazni. So this was the day that we were crossing from the north into Taliban-controlled territory. About an hour down the road, there was a man um, holding, a, holding an AK-47 who took us off the road and, and kidnapped us. Jim called me at work. He told me to come home, that the FBI were at our house. There was a possibility that Katie had been captured in Afghanistan. They are willing to kill us, willing to kill women, to kill children, to kill whomever, frightened of the idea of further executions and further death. I was in a, uh, well, I guess I stayed a shock, I, a disbelief, terrified. If we all come out of this safely and alive, then it will be a miracle. And we found out about the first birth, then we found out about the second birth. We have waited since 2012 for somebody to understand our problems, the Kafka-esque nightmare in which we find ourselves. Jim spent every day, you know, uh, trying to, and myself too, with, with letters and meetings and everything else. And so you'd say, I'm doing what I have to do. I'm doing, you know, and 
as the time went on towards the end, I didn't think I was ever going to see my daughter again. I truly had lost belief. After a couple weeks, we were separated for seven months, and he was put in a separate room. Josh said they kept him in uh, total darkness for periods of it. They did break his nose. He said that they had uh, tied him from the ceiling, suspended him from the ceiling for uh, several hours. Um, so he was, uh, I, I think that uh, Josh was probably tortured during that period. He hit me increasingly throughout captivity. Um, sometimes towards the end, sometimes it was just in anger um, when Josh lost his temper. But he also believed in, uh, he believed in corporal punishment for uh, that a husband should, should spank their wife. Today is January the 10th, 2017 and my family is together at this point and we have just received sex was a big source of anxiety and distress for me throughout most of captivity um, josh demanding it wanting it wanting sexual activity that i wasn't comfortable with all of that but we hope that everything is going well for our family and things here i did you know, I did want to have a big family, but not in captivity. He eventually came to the point where he said, you're so bad, you can't live with us anymore. You have to live in the bathroom stall. This was the darkest point in my whole life, I think. You know, it's, it's really something I, I, I try not to think about, you know, because dwelling on it makes it harder for me to, to go about my day. <laughs> the accused in this case, Joshua Boyle, and the main alleged victim, Caitlin Coleman, are a married couple. That's the Crown Attorney has said that this case will largely turn on the reliability of Coleman's testimony. So much of what the defense has to throw at them is sort of personal attacks. You, you know, you, you really need someone in your corner to, uh, to protect you. I understand that it's the defense attorney's job, so you know, I bear him no ill will, but at the same time, to to take that stand and then have him try to pick apart my story and twist things so it looks like maybe I'm the one at fault, that mirrors that that mirrors how Josh abused me and psychologically beat me down for years. I did not make any note of her crying. I did make a note of her wiping her eye at one particular time. And I believe it was when she was talking about an instance or recounting uh, details of the abuse she allegedly endured. Yesterday, the United States government, working with the government of Pakistan, secured the release of Caitlin Coleman, Joshua Boyle, and their three children from cat captivity from the Haqqani Network, a terrorist organization with ties to the Taliban. They came to our room and said that we're transferring you. We stopped at what seemed to be a, like a checkpoint. The driver got out of the car um, and things got really tense. And there was a lot of arguing in Pashto. 
Another man who was in the car with us jumped into the driver's seat and started driving our car away as fast as he could. The car was pursued. They were firing shots from inside of our car at the people pursuing them. The people pursuing were firing at us. Um, eventually, someone shot out the tires of our car. And then all the kidnappers left the car and ran away as fast as they could. So then they opened the, yeah, the hatchback. Actually, they couldn't get it open, so they had to break it open. Uh, they had to, like, break the glass on it and sort of pull us out. What has surprised me is that the handling of the situation by the Pakistanis, uh, the men who have rescued us, the men who have made all of this possible, has actually made our second day even better than our first day of tasting freedom. U.S. officials tell me that Joshua Boyle would not board the U.S. military flight out of Pakistan. Caitlin Cullen's father tells me tonight his daughter and her family are indeed planning to go to Canada. So SEAL Team 6 was waiting with their helicopter for Katie, Josh, and the kids and told them, you know, they were, they were I think, at a military, military base in Islamabad and told them, come on, come on, come on, run. Josh told Katie, no. We're not going with those people. He believed that U.S. forces were, were out to get him, um, to arrest him, to put him in prison. I got on the phone with Katie and she sounded, um, she sounded like a little robot. She, she just said, you know, no, Josh and I have decided that this is what we are going to do. And then they arrived in Toronto. Joshua had his big, um, you know, media a show that he put on. You want to step forward, Mr. Boyle? I apologize for the lateness of this opportunity. We were delayed. It will be of incredible importance to my family that we are able to build a secure sanctuary for our three surviving children to call a home, to focus on edification, and to try to regain some portion of the childhood that they have lost. Why did you want to go to Afghanistan in 2012? I'm not sure that want is really the correct word. There are things that we do in life because we want to do them. Um, I want to eat chocolate for breakfast. <laughs> but there are also things that we do in life because we're compelled to do them by ourselves, like that we have a compulsion or we do it because we think it's the right thing to do or we do it because we see that nobody else is doing it and it needs to be done. Why, why did you go there? Try to fix things. I mean, there are a lot of people who try to who will say that they are trying to fix Afghanistan, but what they mean, or they will say that they are trying to fix a region, they are trying to fix a problem, they are trying to fix a famine, but they don't actually care about human suffering. They don't actually care about the injustice. They're just trying to build up something they can boast about. He said he wanted to go to Afghanistan. He wanted to get the real story on the Taliban. He thought that they were misrepresented in the Western media now because we were at war with them. The moment that you, like, do you remember the day or the second or the minute that you became a hostage? Like, how did you just... Uh... I don't really remember much of that. Interesting, uh, okay. That part, actually. You know, it's sort of blocked out. Huh. It was scary, but yeah. sort of blocked. So much of what happened to us, people don't view as something that I did so much as something that I was forced to do. Okay. You know, I wasn't forced to go to Afghanistan. Nobody, nobody dragged me there. Everything um, in the media when we first came back from Afghanistan, Pakistan, was um, sort of scripted and in some ways fabricated by my husband. 
Even the points where I was speaking, I was speaking what I'd been told to say. And sometimes I knew that it wasn't totally honest, but I didn't have a choice. In fact, for me, life didn't change much um, after we were released. Josh continued to sort of control every element of my life. Um, he also started, like, I think he started taking on the role of the prison guard. And I know some people might have the question, well, do you still cover your hair because your husband told you to or because he still holds sway over your life? And actually, um, to me, it's very important that I both make choices as far as how I present myself based on doing what I want um, as opposed to what Josh wanted. She's very brave. I don't know a lot of women who would have the guts to get up and say the things that she has said, that she is alleged against Josh. That takes a lot of guts to do that. Put yourself out there for all the world to judge you and say, you know, I am, I am strong. I am not this worthless person who you think I am and who you told me I was. I think that maybe the scariest single moment of my life might have been when I opened the door and started running away from Josh. I had no phone, I had no shoes. Um, I put on like three or four pairs of socks and I took um, my passport and the children's passports with me because I was worried that Josh might try to run with the children in our apartment, there was a front door, which was right next to where Josh was sitting in, in his study, and a back door, which was right next to our bedroom. So there was a door that I like very quietly unlocked because I knew that if Josh heard it open or he heard it unlock, he would come back. And I sort of stood there for, I don't even know how long, but it felt like forever. And then I opened the door and I ran for it. There was a neighbor who lived above us. I could hear them having a party. I could hear them moving around up above. So I ran up the steps to the neighbors upstairs um, and started knocking on the door and yelling help. Josh came out. Within a minute, he was out behind me. The neighbor was not answering. Um, so Josh walked up to me, uh, sort of like slowly, like, oh, baby, what's wrong? Go back inside and we'll talk about it, and grabbed my arm and I started screaming at the top of my lungs at, and he let go and he you know sort of backed off because I kept screaming and kept pounding on that neighbor's door and he whispered to me uh, when they answer you better tell them you're drunk and come back inside and then he went back inside the neighbors never answered the door 911 of Josh do you need police fire or paramedics police where do you need the police? Uh, it's not a great emergency. It's self-harm. Uh, what do you mean? If, um, my wife what? is threatening to kill herself. Has she injured herself? I don't think so, but she was alone in the room. She's run outside. She's screaming at the top of her lungs that she's going to kill herself. She's bad for the children. Uh, she has BPD. Um, Sorry, she has what? Uh, borderline personality disorder. Um, ex extreme mental instability, as well as PTSD and a few other things. And I'm really worried for her right now. So I waited another minute or two, but it was clear they weren't going to answer the door. 
So I crept down the steps past our door and I took off at a run down the street. Half a block down the street was a Papa Joe's pizzeria. And so when I got there, they had shut their doors for the night, but they were still inside cleaning up. So I started pounding on their door and they didn't want to answer, but they could see me. So they came over and like kind of very tentatively opened the door and said, you know, what do you need? And I said, I just need to use your phone. I just need to use your phone. I get the call from Katie and, and she said that she was, she had run away, run out of Josh's house and that she needed to come to my hotel. And, uh, and she didn't know what to do. And I said, well, you're coming to my hotel. I get a cab. And uh, she said she didn't, you know, she didn't have a purse, shoes, uh, coat, anything. I remember one of the men was just staring at my feet and being like, girl, you have no shoes. And, and that was very important. Get her, get her some shoes, get her some shoes. And to me, I'm like, who cares about my shoes, you know? This is life or death. She had hidden some money in her uh, bra, so she got the cab to the hotel. I was waiting outside for her. It shouldn't be long, we'll get some officers to see you there, okay? Okay, okay. I'll just try to be gentle with her. She is really going through a rough time. They say, open up the doors. This is the Ottawa Police Department. And they say that her husband had called and uh, that said that she had run away. Uh, she was hysterical. She was suicidal. Then she started both verbally and writing down uh, lists of instances where Josh had abused her physically, abused her sexually. So I had absolutely no idea of what he was doing to her during this time and how bad, how bad he was making her feel and how worthless he was making her feel. It's one of the things that tears me up because as a mother, I should have known. I want to speak out um, on behalf of other women who maybe ha aren't able to speak out or haven't even reached a point where they, you know, realize that they need to. I've found relations with him um, pretty abhorrent, but I didn't have a choice. The reason why I would caution survivors about going to the media mid-trial is that while it can increase the chances of uh, an acquittal, I don't see any way that it can increase the chances of a conviction. On one level, it would run the risk of maybe looking, making her look vindictive. The more versions that are out there, the more likely there's been an inconsistency. Her credibility and coherence as a witness may be an issue in this trial. I don't think she fully understood the gravity or the consequence of what was going to, or what could happen at that particular moment. I think that the defense zeroed in on the fact that she went to the media because defense counsel knows that there is an order in place saying you shouldn't discuss your testimony with anyone. There is a way that it provides an additional chink in her armor to say that she has uh, that she has gone to the media despite a judicial order not to. It's one more reason the judge could rely on to find that she's not credible. Oh, 
can't imagine what I've been through. Nobody can imagine what I've been through. That doesn't say anything about you. I know that nobody can imagine it. Like, I'm not attacking you. I'm just trying to explain that, as I said before, if you're a prisoner, you don't trust anyone. The defense has argued that each sexual interaction Joshua Boyle had with his wife was consensual. It sometimes involved bondage, biting and slapping, but Boyle testified that he always asked and stomped at his wife's request. Boyle's lawyer stood up and said, we'll now be calling Joshua Boyle to the stand. And Boyle popped up, walked into the witness box, leaned back into his chair, and kind of leaned onto one side in a very, I don't want to say almost like he was comfortable. And he began to recount his version of, of, of the story. Boyle has said, I was the victim. She was the one who was controlling. She was the one who was uh, physically and emotionally abusive to me. I have been nothing but a, a loving and supporting husband who actually wanted out of this marriage. That's exactly why we refer to these as he said, she said cases. It's he said, she said, because that kind of direct contradiction comes up primarily in sexual assault cases where there tends to have been nobody else around when it occurred. He says that uh, Coleman had a hard time adjusting to life after returning from Afghanistan. He is talking about her mental health struggles, that it was Coleman who was the absent mother. It was I who was taking care of the kids. It was I who was cooking all the meals. It would be devastating for the courts to acquit Josh. You think that he would take, try to take the children back? Yes, um, I think he would. And I think that he might use legal means if he believed that he could take them back. I think that Josh can't stand the idea that something that he considers his was taken away from him. My lawyer called me on the phone and said, we won. That was her first words to me, we won. And she's like, when you get this order, go right away. Because when you get the order, you can legally cross the border. My sister and Joanne were with the kids and we said, start packing up the stuff. We're leaving as soon as we can get over there and get everything packed in the car. And then we had this very narrow window to get everybody uh, out. And then we get in the car and we drive to the border and we get to the border and they're very civil and welcoming at the border, but they do ask me for that piece of paper. We're all trying to act very cool for the kids. You know, this is this is a fun trip. You're going down to visit, you know, uh, Nona Moose and uh, Abumi, keeping them unaware, you know, of background and seriousness of the situation. And so I hand them the court order um, at which point they take it, they process it, and then uh, the border agent comes back to me and she shakes my hand and she says, welcome home. What was your reaction? Um, I was pretty, you know, I was pretty excited and overwhelmed and, and, and also just so honored that she, that, you know, she made that gesture too. So <laughs> finally we were free. Truck. Josh took a lot of the best years of my life from me. Okay. okay. Be gentle with your brother, okay? But at the same time, what I have gained is a degree of strength and a degree of 
um, ability to deal with any situation that arises because I was, you know, I was in the depths of hell for so long. I do my best to tell her as often as possible how amazing I think she is. I think she's an amazing mom. I think she's an amazing woman. And um, I'm just so happy she's home.